So the topic of today's uh, discussion is MyOT. And uh, the, you know, MyOT first, it's one of the pro uh, protocols for IO, industrial IoT. Uh, although we say industrial IoT, uh, there's nothing uh, you know, hard coded in the standard to say that it can't be used for commercial purposes, uh, let's say in uh, home automation and stuff like that. But it's unlikely that it will be used in those scenarios. Mostly it will be used for uh, industrial IoT kind of applications. So the standard first came to my attention about two, three months back, and I started reading up on that. And as a result of that, uh, I wrote a couple of articles on Devopedia, which you can go through later on, uh, maybe uh, later today or uh, during the weekend when, uh, when you get time. But uh, this will be the uh, you know basis uh, that on on which we will be discussing today what this technology is all about. So initially I'll give an introduction to MyOT, and later we'll go into the deeper technical aspects of the protocol itself, which is there in the second article. So MyOT, uh, why do we need another uh, IoT protocol? Uh, so in the world of IoT, uh, there are uh, of course, uh, you know, IoT spans a wide range uh, from cellular, Wi-Fi, uh, RFID type of technologies, and then uh, you have LoRa, Sigfox. So, so many different wireless protocols are there. For those of you who are very new to IoT, uh, basic, uh, we are not going to define what IoT is, but one of the components of IoT is the communication channel. So, let's say you have a bunch of sensors on the field and you need those sensors to send the data to the cloud. Because in the cloud, you can aggregate all this data coming from different sensors, and then you can build intelligence and analytics on top of that. So the need for getting all the data into the cloud, that is where the connectivity becomes important. And when it comes to connectivity, you can either have wireline or wireless. Wireline doesn't make sense when you have you know, hundreds and thousands or even tens of thousands of sensors out there. So the way to do connectivity for IoT is wireless. And in that context, we have so many different standards, like I mentioned. So one of the group of standards is called LP-WAN, that is Low Power Wide Area Network. Right? WAN, you already may be familiar, it's a very common terminology in networking. LP-WAN is Low Power Wide Area Network. So why is low power important? Because Many of these sensors, they are deployed once or installed once in an application and uh, almost forgotten. Nobody is going to go there and you know change the batteries after three months or after even three years. So it is installed once and forgotten. So when you have that kind of a requirement, this is important, low power. So it's very important for your device, devices to be uh, consuming as little uh, power as possible so that it can run, let's say, on a small battery for 10 years, maybe even 20 years. So from that context, you can't use things like Wi-Fi or cellular. They, they are too power hungry. So what we need is a low uh, protocols which are more power efficient. So that's where you know this concept of low power wide area network came in. And in this context, there are multiple standards already out there, as you can see on the screen. You have LoRa, you have Sigfox, and this is actually MyOT. Don't worry about the name MyThings here. This is a trademark name from one of the companies. But the protocol behind this is actually MyOT. So now the question is, when you already have so many protocols out there, why do you need one more? Because some of these protocols are already established in the sense that a lot of uh, commercial deployments have already happened, both for Sigfox and LoRa. And of course, you know the cellular standards are always there. So they are not going to you know, uh, just watch the competition and keep quiet. So they are also there. Now the differences, uh, let's point out a key differences uh, among these and where MyOT fits in. So take, for example, any unlicensed band. One of the problem is any unlicensed band is interference. So interference is a big problem in unlicensed band. So I, I launched a Sigfox network, let's say in 868 megahertz, which is uh, possible in Europe. 915 megahertz is the spectrum allocated in US. 
So I take one of these two bands and launch my Sigfox Netfox. Unfortunately, because these are unlicensed band, there could be uh, different other technologies which are also operating in these bands. Just like, for example, if you take a 2.4 gigahertz band, where there are so many technologies operating, Wi-Fi, for example, and then we have uh, Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy, so all the and even RFID, I don't know if it is in 2.4. So there are so many uh, technologies and devices crowding that space. Same thing is here in 80, 868 and 915. So interference is a big thing in unlicensed spectrum. That is one problem which cellular technologies solve. So within cellular, there is a substandard called NB-IoT. There are others, for example, ECGSM, that's another one catering to IoT devices. Then there is also LTEM. That's a different, again, coming from the cellular standards. So cellular standards have the advantage that they are licensed. That is why interference is not a problem because the particular spectrum can be used only by uh, uh, cellular standards who have been assigned that particular, or rather operators who are licensed to use that technology in a specific geographical area. So the interference problem is solved with cellular. Unfortunately, with cellular, they are not very power efficient. They may be power efficient for your mobile, for your laptops and stuff like that, but they are not power efficient for IoT devices. Remember what we talked about, we wanted a device to operate on a battery, let's say even a coin cell battery for 10 years, for 15 years. So that is definitely not possible if the sensor device is going to be using you know, NB IoT for transmission. But of course, it has other advantages. It, it can scale, it, it is fairly robust because it's a proven technology. And another important thing going for cellular is it's standardized. So I can buy a device or sensor device from any uh, one who says he is conforming to the standard. And I know that it will work with a base station, whether it is Airtel or, you know, Reliance Geo, whoever is providing NB IoT as part of their platform, I know that uh, my sensor device is going to work with that. So that is the power of standardization, uh, and uh, that standardization is missing in LoRa and Sigfox. So although we have LoRa Alliance promoting it, it is not a standard. Again, it is kind of controlled by a group of people who are part of that alliance. And the same thing can be said of Sigfox. So as you can see here, you know, all of this have advantages in certain specific areas, but none of these technologies is able to meet all the different criteria that we need for an IoT device. And this is exactly where uh, MyOT comes in. So as we will see here, it is power efficient, it can scale beautifully, it is standardized and it is immune to interference. And how it is able to achieve this, we will see uh, shortly when we go in deeper into the technology. So to conclude this, a brief comparison of the uh, kind of bit rates we are talking about. If you talk about uh, LTE, all the cellular standards, LTE, uh, EGSM, NBIoT, and even uh, yeah, LoRa, they are all talking about in the range of 250 uh, kilobits per second. Right? In fact, LTEM is 1 Mbps. Sigfox, on the other hand, is operating at a very low rate. It is at 100 bits per second. It's a, at a very low rate. So now where does MyOT fit in? MyOT actually fits into this space. It is offering something like uh, 400 bits per second. So now the question is, uh, uh, is that sufficient? So you may ask, you know, uh, uh, is 400 BPS or even 100 BPS, is that sufficient for a sensor device? So in the, IO, in the world of IoT, this is exactly what you need. You don't need something like 250 kbps. So in that sense, NB-IoT is kind of over design. And by nature of that, because it is 250 kbps, you are compromising on the power efficiency. You are also compromising on the scalability. So that is the kind of problem that uh, MyOT aims to solve. So it brings down the bitrate to a very low level at 400 BPS, similar to Sigfox. So it is in that uh, range. And then it has a few more other technical changes uh, that makes it better than Sigfox. Okay. So the point I wanted to emphasize here is that all these technologies, they have their niche applications. 
but none of them still you know suit what uh, the world of industrial iot requires because one of the things in industrial iot is robustness remember you are uh, operating let's say an industrial in oil and gas industry you are operating a wireless network for wireless monitoring and control or for example in a nuclear power plant so there the transmission technology has to be very robust you cannot afford to lose even a single packet so that kind of robustness is not coming in lora and sigfox mainly because of their problem with interference but my iot is solving that uh, so interference problem is solved and as a result the transmission is very much robust and how it is done we will look at it shortly okay uh, the other thing i want to emphasize here is topology many of you might have heard uh, or read about topology in uh, networking so you have bus topology ring topology uh, mesh topology and then uh, star so these are the common ones which we have read about in uh, let's say when we are studying networking in college in wireless the two main topologies used are mesh topology and uh, star topology so mesh topology an example of that uh, could be for example bluetooth mesh so that offers uh, mesh or even zigbee zigbee also uh, has i believe uh, mesh uh, and in the uh, in the mili in military people used to use uh, ad hoc networks so it used to go by the name of manet uh, so in ad hoc networks it is all mesh there is no centralized base station one node will send the data to a na neighboring node that neighboring node will relay the data to the next node until it gets to the infrastructure or to the cloud so that is how mesh networking works the problem with mesh networking is again power efficiency and uh, it's hard to guarantee robustness because it has to do it hop by hop and what if one of the relay nodes in between goes down what if it has a its battery has gone down or it is experiencing uh, interference then the whole route takes a hit and all the nodes now uh, in that vicinity they have to find alternate routes so it may be okay in uh, in ad hoc networks but you know mesh networking hasn't been widely deployed at least in the industrial iot space and uh, mesh networking also has the problem of uh, latency because imagine you have to send uh, data through so many intermediate nodes by the time it reaches uh, the base station or the gateway you are already incurring a huge uh, latency so for mission critical applications where you need low latency uh, mesh networking has not been uh, widely deployed so that is where another thing uh, another decision by myot myot does not support mesh topology it only meets uh, star topology so the topology supported by myot is star so at this point i'll give a pause if anyone has questions you can ask it may be early for questions but anyway i'm giving a short pause uh, arvin that's nice introduction but one question this claim that it's better against interference is it based on simulations or practice or how uh, or design yeah first is uh, simulations uh, in the patent itself uh, it is based on uh, not even simulations uh, you you can do a theoretical calculation because uh, it is uh, not a physical layer you don't need even physical layer simulation it is a very simple method uh, they are simply packetizing the original packet so just by uh, using uh, uh, probability and the uh, equation they have shown that it can result in a much lower packet error rate and subsequently so that is uh, what it was in the original patent but subsequently when it was commercialized when the first uh, chipsets came out and uh, they did the real world uh, or let's say lab simulations it was proven that the packet error rate is low any other questions before we move on okay if not i'll uh, continue so that was the introduction about myot uh, so what are the use cases uh, so you can see here uh, some of the use cases 
Now, if you look at this, you see I have compared all the different technologies, RFID, Wi-Fi, all these are used in IoT, BLE, ZigBee, Cellular, and uh, LP1. So this first column is actually MyOT, kind of MyOT, LP1 star. So I already mentioned to you that MyOT adopts a star topology, which is the same with cellular. Even in cellular, our mobile phone talks directly to the base station. Our mobile phone doesn't route the packet to a neighboring mobile phone and then it goes to the network. So all cellular systems are star. Zigbee mostly mesh, BLE star and mesh, Wi-Fi star and mesh. Uh, yeah, there is a mesh option, RFID point to point. So let's take RFID. We are all familiar with RFID, smart retail, and then logistics, asset tracking. So these are uh, uh, typical applications for RFID, very short distance communication. Yeah. Then uh, we have uh, Wi-Fi, which almost every home in an urban area will have Wi-Fi these days. So for a smart home, Wi-Fi can be used for automation. It can also be used in connected cars and smart retail, but the best use case for Wi-Fi is currently the smart home, home automation. Then BLE, a lot of use cases, smart home, wearables, uh, connected health, smart retail, uh, Zigbee, smart home, uh, yeah, to some extent uh, industrial also, this is smart building. Cellular, cellular you see doesn't fit in many cases. Industrial IoT somewhat suitable, but not a great fit. It is, it is a good fit for logistics asset tracking because of the distances, you know, cellular can cover connected health and so on. But where MyOT uh, comes in, it comes in uh, strongly in the industrial IoT space uh, for which we needed uh, highly robust technology, low packet error rates uh, can be, uh, yeah, so resilient to interfer interference, should be able to scale. So when I talk about scale, we are not talking about 1000 devices per base station or even 10,000 devices. We are talking about 100,000 devices and above able to connect to a single base station. So that is what LP1 is able to provide. Smart metering application. So take for example, today you have a connection uh, or a subscription with Bescom. So you uh, with uh, MyOT, the meter can directly send the reading to uh, Bescom. So today some of the apartments might have wireless technology to do this, but the thing is they are relying on power. They are not relying on batteries, but with MyOT you can replace it with batteries. So you will have more flexibility in uh, deploying smart meters. So in all smart city deployments, smart buildings, smart agriculture. So here the beauty is uh, we need range because in agriculture, you know, the sensors may be on the field far away from the base station. So we need range and at the same time, uh, you are not sending a lot of data. At the most, you are sending readings of the soil and the, uh, giving control messages to trigger irrigation. So the amount of data to be transferred on the interface is also very small. So and you may have, you know, thousands of sensors out there on the field. So smart agriculture is another field where uh, you know, MyOT comes in very strong. So these are the use cases uh, where MyOT is suitable. Okay, so in fact, uh, one of the things which, you know, a lot of documents on the web talk about when they talk about MyOT is they use this term massive IOT. It's not exactly an acronym, but you know, Nowhere it is mentioned that you know M stands for massive, but this is the way you know some websites are projecting it. So we are talking about something like 100,000 plus endpoints, which can be supported by a single base station, and the base station is able to handle 1.5 million messages per day. In fact, uh, recently, uh, recently meaning uh, let's say. Yeah, May 2020, that is just uh, last month. So Fraunhofer in Germany, uh, their researchers achieved 3.5 million telegrams. Telegram, you can say it's a message, okay? Uh, this is the MyOT specific terminology. So telegram is nothing but a message. 3.5 uh, 
million messages per day per base station. So this is this kind of scale they are able to achieve. So uh, and no other competing technology, neither LoRa or Sigfox, they come close to this. OK, so before we go into the actual technology, uh, let's look at uh, some history. Uh, so the research into the underlying uh, transmission technology was started by Fraunhofer Institute in Germany back in 2009. And uh, you know, in 2011, they filed the patent. Uh, first, it was a German patent, and subsequently, they filed a US patent and uh, in other countries as well. Uh, so we'll talk about the patent shortly. Uh, then uh, uh, the same institute, Fraunhofer, in 2015, they registered a trademark of Myoti. So Myoti is kind of the commercial name for the underlying technology. Uh, so the underlying technology is patented based on that Myoti trademark has been obtained. And after that, in 2018, HC published it as a standard. So this is also a good uh, like insight for people who want to know how standards are formed. So what happens is somebody invents a technology, they patent it, and then they uh, start discussion with HC or other standardization bodies, and then they try to get their technology into the standard. And if and when they are successful, then others also start adopting their standard in their implementation. And though it is a standard, they have to pay royalties to, or they have to have some sort of a licensing agreement with the original patent holders. So they have a trademark on MyOT, but they are also the patent holder for the underlying technology. So, you know, this is uh, like an insight that you can take away. You know, just inventing something is not sufficient. You invent it, you patent it, and then you try to get it into the standard. Then you can uh, have a much wider, uh, you know, custom, uh, adoption for that technology, and commercially also it will be successful. And there are plenty of examples out there. Qualcomm, for example, you know, CDMA technology was patented and became a standard. So then you have, uh, and these are other milestones. So in 2018, July, Behar Tech, they have licensed the technology from Franofer, and then they they claim to be the first to offer a MyOT solution that's compliant with the HC standard. And then uh, in March 2021, they started offering a MyOT gateway. So MyOT itself is promoted by Alliance, just like LoRa Alliance, Wi-Fi Alliance. So standard alone is not enough. You need a body to promote it. And why do we need this body? Because this body helps in making things interoperable. So let's say I make a gateway. Somebody else makes a sensor node for MyOT. By being part of this alliance, you get early access to their gateway or to somebody else's uh, devices. So you can do interoperability testing and you will be early in the market. And the alliances will offer other services also, like other than interoperability, they may have uh, some certification procedure and say that, okay, this device is compliant with the HC standard. Things like that are done by the alliances. And uh, some of the highlights why MyOT is becoming popular. Uh, so MyOT won the annual uh, award, which is well recognized award in the world of technology. So they won the Joseph von Fraunhofer Prize in 2021. Uh, so this uh, it so happened that uh, the award is also given by the Fraunhofer. Uh, but uh, this is an industry recognized award. So a lot of people from uh, outside Fraunhofer also win these awards. So in 2021, uh, MyOT won the award. And another interesting thing is, although MyOT is for terrestrial applications, it is not designed. It has not been designed for, you know, satellite applications. But Fraunhofer did a successful test of MyOT with a geo satellite, which is at a distance of 38,000 kilometers from Earth. So this is kind of impressive, and it was done at S band 2 gigahertz. So this test is kind of like uh, a validation of the underlying technology. 
that uh, maybe it is designed for terrestrial, but it could be used for in future for satellite applications as well. Then uh, Behar Tech we mentioned earlier in 2018, they did the first uh, implementations. So in 2021, they won uh, Industrial IoT Solution of the Year Award. So these awards are given by Mobile Breakthrough Awards. So of course uh, you have to take these things with a pinch of salt because uh, we don't know how transparent the process is behind the scenes, how they select the uh, candidates and how these awards are re rewarded. Uh, but uh, yeah, Behar Tech uh, seems to be a recognized name in the industry and they are among the first to come out with an implementation. And uh, we already saw about the you know, the latest milestone 3.5 million telegrams per day per base station. So who are the uh, members of the alliance today? Texas Instruments, big names, uh, Franoffer, of course, Dell metering. So remember we said, uh, you know, one of the important application is smart metering. So, they, so a lot of metering companies are joining uh, or people who are providing equipment for metering companies, they are joining the alliance. Stackforce, they are providing the software stack for uh, MyOT. So what is the software stack uh, composed of? Uh, so the MyOT uh, kind of standard defines radio layer, physical layer, MAC layer, then there is a link layer which is not shown here. So these are the things which are uh, defined. And anything about link layer, network layer, that is outside the scope of the standard, HC standard. Okay. What are the devices for MyOT? So you might have seen this diagram earlier. So you have you need a base station. You need an endpoint. Uh, typically, uh, this is a this is the communication module, and it is integrated with the sensors, which which are relevant to that application. So we mentioned already that it's a star network. So like hundreds of these, or even tens and thousands of these, are going to connect to a single base station which will then be connected to the cloud. And all your visualization and analytics will run on the cloud. OK, now if you are prototyping a solution, obviously you will not start here. You will need something like an evaluation board. And there are companies uh, making these evaluation boards as well. OK. Any questions before we move to the underlying technology? So we covered, uh, you know, the basics of uh, IoT, uh, MyOT rather. So now we'll get into the underlying technology. Any questions at this point? Yeah, I have one question is uh, regarding you. Yeah, talk about the uh, satellite communication also. My IoT can be used for satellite. So how the power efficiency can be made in if it said 38,000 kilometer railway satellite. How the uh, uh, equipment power efficiency can be maintained? Yeah, so unfortunately, actually, uh, MyOT is designed for terrestrial applications, not for satellite applications. And this okay, particular okay. new story, which has come out from Faranofer, they have not shared technical details of what this test is actually. So okay, the okay. question that you asked, similar questions, you know, I think all developers and engineers will have. But unfortunately, Franofer, they have not shared further technical de details of this particular uh, test. Oh, so okay, okay. that means they are they are keeping those details private at the moment. Oh, okay, okay. Thanks very much. Thanks. Any other questions before we move on? OK, so now we come to the interesting bit. Uh, many of you may be very keen exactly how it is achieving it. But the base, you will be surprised that the fundamentals are very simple. So this is all there is. See, this is a typical packet. Let's say a LoRa packet or a Sigfox packet. So a packet is going out. It takes a certain time to be transferred on the air interface and it is transferred on a specific frequency. Uh, but actually LoRa and Sigfox also, they do frequency hopping. But for simplicity, let's take it like this. 
the packet is transferred on a single frequency and it spans a certain amount of time. And during the transmission time, if there is a major interference, let's say here, then the entire packet is lost. The receiver cannot decode the packet. Now, this is not uh, such an unlikely scenario. It is uh, very common in an unlicensed band. So, interferers are many. And if your packet is a long transmission time, it is uh, highly likely that you know it will get lost. So, what MyOT does, it does two things. First thing is it breaks up the packet into many small pieces. Secondly, these small pieces are frequency hopped. That is, that, that is to say, uh, you know, up to 24 frequencies are there and all these packets will go across all these 24 different frequencies. One of your mics is not muted. Thank you. So the thing is frequency hopping happens. So the packet is split into multiple sub packets and they are all going in different frequencies. Not only that, they don't go on the same time. In fact, they go on a very long time frame. So uh, that is the reason why you have a very low data rate for MyOT. We are talking about uh, you know 400 bits per second or in that order, below one kilobit per second. So the packet is transmitted over a long period of time. So even if, we, if you have a bursty interference, let's say an interferer here, which is affecting all the frequencies, Still, the packet can be recovered because you still have enough redundancy which is spread across a longer time frame. And it is uh, the probability of having interference in so many time periods is low. And uh, now the question, of course, you will ask uh, how come I can recover the data even though I lost so many packets due to inf interference? And the reason for that is it uses uh, forward error co uh, correction code and uh, error correction. And the exact one used is convolution code one third rate. So that gives it a sufficient redundancy to recover even in spite of uh, lost packets. So those of you who don't know about block coding, convolutional coding, don't worry about it. Basically, there is a method mathematically proven uh, and widely deployed uh, that even though you may lose some packets in the air interface, uh, the, math the mathematics guarantees that you have enough information in the rest of the packets to decode the original data. So that is uh, what uh, you know uh, MyOT adopts. Now you will notice that uh, something interesting here. This is whatever MyOT has done, nothing revolutionary here. Frequency of have hopping has been there for a long time. It is not something they invented. In fact, even GSM has frequency hopping. GSM is like a 40 year old technology. I'm sure uh, frequency hopping in GSM has been there for at least 30, 35 years. And this concept of splitting a packet into smaller packets, this is nothing but packet switching, which has been the underpinning of the internet from the 1970s. So this is also nothing new. So uh, where, where did MyOT succeed, where others have not succeeded? Because as you see here, their idea is not you know completely new what they have done rather is to look at the use case for iot you look at the use case for industrial iot and they figured out that uh, you know most of the industrial iot requires only a very low bit rate high bit rate is not important and they also figured out that uh, robustness is very important for industrial iot even though i lose packets i should be able to recover so by starting from the needs perspective, what my application requires, what industrial IoT requires, then they work backwards to the, towards this technology and then they combined existing techniques into a very nice uh, uh, transmission scheme. So the scheme itself is called uh, TSMA. So the actual name for this is, uh, I don't know if I have written it here. Yeah, the name for this is uh, TSMA, Telegram Splitting Multiple Access. And this telegram, so this, whatever we see here, this pack, packet in orange, that was originally called or named in the patent as telegram. So that is the terminology we are still adopting. But don't confuse this. This is nothing to do with the olden days telegram or with the telegram uh, Android app or anything like that. 
right? So the telegram is the larger packet, which is now split into sub packets and then sent across frequencies and time. And the entire technique is called telegram splitting multiple access. Now this technique is standardized by HC and it goes by the name of telegram splitting ultra narrowband. So this is the technical term from the standard perspective, from HC's perspective. The name used is TSUNB, telegram splitting ultra narrowband. Now this TSUNB itself is part of a bigger standard called low throughput networks, which is standardized by HC. So under LTN, which is low throughput network, there are actually three different protocol families. And uh, TSUNB is one of them. That mean, meaning that uh, there are two other alternatives to implement uh, LTN networks. But today our discussion is purely on the telegram splitting uh, technique. So this is uh, where we are today. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, so TSUNB is standardized by HC, but it is commercialized under the trademark of MyOT and promoted by MyOT Alliance. So this is where we stand in terms of state of the uh, in terms of the market and uh, that this is the underlying technology. And who are the vendors? You might ask uh, vendors. There are many. Uh, so as I mentioned in the earlier uh, image, some people make base stations, some people make uh, endpoint modules, some make both. And uh, some are only making the chipsets and so forth. Uh, some focus only on the protocol stack software. So uh, you can read about it later. I won't go into great detail, but uh, yeah, chipsets are available from Radio Crafts, Silicon Labs, TI, ST Microelectronics. TI has CC1310 wireless MCU, which you know incorporates the RF transceiver plus uh, ARM MCU. So uh, now there are more powerful ones, including this one, CC1352R, which integrates a BLE stack, uh, BLE capability also on the same chip. Then a gateway available from Red Tech Swiss Phone. So many people are making gateways. Some people uh, are making only endpoints. Examples are Radio Crafts and Sentinum. Then you have uh, people like Res IoT. So they have not yet released their uh, software solution. But what these guys are planning is to uh, offer a complete MyOT network solution, which includes the base station, service center, application center. So the network deployment is like this. You have endpoints here. Let me try to enlarge this. You have the endpoints here, which are sending your data through the MyOT air interface. They go to the base station. So we already talked about this. From the base station, data goes to the service center. So this is the one managing the entire network of all the base stations, part of the network. And from the service center, it goes to our application center, which may do certain functions not done by the service center. Then it goes to the cloud, where the actual analytics will happen. Okay, but I remember that uh, like in uh, cellular, the service centers and application centers are actual need not be specialized hardware boxes. They can actually be running on the cloud completely virtualized. So that advantage is also there in this architecture. So there is nothing special about uh, these service centers and application centers. They can be completely virtualized in the cloud. Any questions at this point? Hi, Arvind. Yeah, go ahead, Syed. Yeah, one question like uh, from the base station to the end point, uh, what will be the distance? What will be the maximum distance that we can uh, uh, cover? Yeah, so for uh, distance, I have talked about it here in this article. I think for urban uh, line of sight, not line of sight, yeah, urban five kilometers should be possible. Okay. And, okay. Uh, for rural, they claim up to 20 kilometers. Okay, great. So you can see here range is about 5 kilometers non line of sight and 20 kilometers in line of sight. But then, you know, if you see different reports, you will get slightly different figures. Some will say 15 kilometers. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. Uh, yeah, you can say in that range, 15 to 20 kilometers line of sight you can achieve. Okay. 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 So this is what is uh, making a difference for let's say agricultural applications, where your sensors may be very far from the base station. And yeah. even for uh, any kind of uh, remote, uh, let's say water metering or gas metering from rural areas, this helps. And in urban areas, five kilometers is uh, pretty good. So uh, what it means, uh, what it means is that suppose you have an electric meter in the basement, still it will be able to get in touch with the base station and uh, get the readings through. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. This is good information. So some technical details we will cover uh, for those who are interested in the these. So we talked about uh, you know frequency hopping. We talked about time. So some details about these things. So in the uplink, data is spread across 24 carriers. And in the downlink, it is spread. Uh, it goes in 18 radio bursts. Downlink also we have 24 carriers, but the number of radio bursts is uh, 18. Uh, so that means one radio frame is uh, split into uh, 18 bursts. So th that is what it is. Uh, frequency bands, we talked about it. Europe 868 megahertz, US 915 megahertz. And they say that even if 50% of the sub packets are lost, you can still recover the original information. Data rate about 40 BPS application. Let's say 10 bytes of application data can be sent in about 400 milliseconds. So we are not talking about 100 bytes or 1000 bytes. So we are talking about very few bytes, which is what many of these industrial IoT applications require. UT cycle is as low as 0.1%. And rest of the time uh, the device will be sleeping, sleeping. And uh, this gives a power consumption of so during uh, transmission, power consumption is like uh, like 20 microwatt power per message. So this is where they get the estimate. The batteries can last for 20 plus years. And the standard comes uh, defines by default encryption and integrity pro protection on the messages as well. So these things are not compromised. And the encryption used is AES 128. So these are some of the technical details. More details are in this article. Where much more uh, details are covered. So this is uh, too technical for us to go into right now. Maybe a few things I will mention. Uh, the standard defines some profiles to make it easier for uh, manufacturers to uh, achieve interoperability. So in Europe, uh, three profiles are there. The difference is in terms of the bandwidth. So the standard bandwidth is 100 kilohertz bandwidth in which the transmission takes place. And a single channel. Then in the other profiles, you have dual channel and then you go to a higher bandwidth, 750 kilohertz bandwidth. In the US, there is one profile which is similar to EU2. Another important point which is uh, good to know is that there are three classes of devices. Class Z device is monitoring only. That means let's say you installed a sensor in a nuclear plant. All it does is monitor the radiation level and send the reading. It cannot be controlled remotely. It cannot be configured or reconfigured, nothing. Its only job is monitoring. So that means this is capable of only uplink transfer. No downlink is possible. Simplest device. The next uh, higher device is class A device where it is capable of not only monitoring but also configuration. So the base station can reconfigure the device. So what kind of reconfigurations we are talking about? Uh, it's of course application dependent. But let's say the device is sending a reading every hour. And then uh, you decide that, you know, after uh, three years, you decide that power, the battery health is going down. Then you reconfigure the device saying that, uh, okay, I don't send me every hour. You send me once in five hours, one reading. So that kind of reconfiguration, uh, I mean, I gave one example. There are many types of reconfiguration that can happen. 
now the real interesting question is how do you, how does the base station send or when does the base station send data to the device i cannot send any time because if i do that i will compromise on the power efficiency right so let what i really mean is the device is sleeping most of the time remember we saw that the duty cycle is 0.1% so there is no way for the base station to know when the device is going to wake up okay so how does the base station actually when does the base station send downlink commands to the uh, device so in this class a devices all downlink is triggered by an uplink so what it means is device a has to first wake up it has to do an uplink transmission for let's say monitoring and in response to that the base station will immediately there is a very well defined time when the base station can reply with the downlink commands so in this class a it is triggered by the uplink uh, transmission now uh, in the case of uh, class b devices beyond configuration you can also command so this is uh, more useful for actuators uh, like a door opening or closing a door or in industrial applications like opening or closing a wall things like that so this has uh, low latency requirements and uh, i'm not sure if this uh, this also will have a duty cycle and uh, uplink triggered but i don't remember right away if this can go so there is a beacon here so yes so there is a beacon involved here in this uh, class b devices so the beacon will be monitored by the device and if the device is being addressed in the beacon then the device knows when to receive the command so this is a more powerful uh, class of devices but i expect that this will have a lower power efficiency compared to these two so batteries uh, with class a and class z can last much longer than the class b devices so these are the kind of things you need to know and uh, the rest of it i'm going to skip because it is uh, too detailed uh, but uh, the details are captured in this particular uh, article so you can go back and read this article meanwhile uh, for today's session we'll use the time for any q and a you may have and based on that we can take it forward yeah i have one small query regarding yeah. the class b cases how how the base station can uh, trigger a particular command to a particular uh, node i mean Uh, I need to trigger a particular node. Is it is identified yeah, so through IP? Yeah, protocol defines. Yeah, protocol defines that. Uh, so as uh, as can be expected, there is something called addressing. Just like we have IP addresses for yeah 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 normal yeah, yeah, computers, okay. yeah. every device endpoint has an address. Okay okay. And there are two types of addresses. It can either be a 16-bit short address, which is configured during the attach procedure. or it can be a globally unique 60 64 bit address according to the ieee specs okay okay got it got it thanks so based on this addressing it will take action okay thanks any other questions Uh, Arvind, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So you know, uh, you mentioned about LoRa and Sigfox, right? So I know LoRa, for example, Tata had deployed in India also. They yeah. had this nationwide network. Uh, so don't they have already got a huge edge with respect to, uh, let's say, deployments in? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, that that is why some people feel that uh, you know, MyOT is late to the competition. but if you look at it from a technical perspective and also uh, the fact that it is a now a hc standard there is a, you know a lot of enthusiasm in the industry that uh, myot is going to pick up see uh, lora the problem with lora is still it is not so power efficient compared to uh, myot lora is operating at 250 kbps 
compared to Sigfox, which is at uh, 100 b uh, bits per second. LoRa is operating at a higher uh, bit rate, which is not really required for many of these applications. And uh, there is uh, one study done where, uh, so now to answer the question of interference, there is one study done uh, where, uh, I don't know uh, the exact specifics, uh, the, uh, but uh, five percent, uh, LoRa experienced 5% uh, packet error rate, whereas in the case of uh, Myoti, no packet was lost because of the way it does the splitting of the telegram and transmits. Yeah, interesting. Actually, LoRa also uses some kind of spread spectrum, right? So, maybe. yeah, chirp spread spectrum. Yeah, something like that, I think. Yeah. So it uh, the and it is also kind of frequency hopping because what mm. is a chirp? It is basically shifting in uh, the frequency domain. Correct. Right. But then uh, the packetization is missing. That mm. is to say. In MyOT, the advantage is it is splitting the telegram into sub packets. Right. And then uh, using uh, CRC for each of those sub packets. Plus, uh, on the whole uh, telegram, it is using a convolution code one third rate. So, mm -hmm. those things are uh, playing in uh, MyOT's flavor, flavor. Also, I think the bit rate is very low, right? So, yeah. yeah. It will fundamentally help. Right? See, the thing is, it is not sending everything one shot. It is mm. spreading it over a long time. Mm. And frequency. Yeah. So if you compare against LoRa, we may say that in frequency domain, LoRa is also doing spreading. But LoRa is sending everything one shot. True. In time domain, it is not spreading. True. Here, this is splitting, splitting it into mm. sub packets and sending it over a longer period of time. Mm. So there it gets some advantage. Mm. But the, the, what I'm still not very convinced about is that from so reliability, I, I take your point because lower rate and also splitting across time and frequency. But with all this one third convolutional code, long distances to cover, I'm not sure if the power efficiency and because fundamentally low rate, right? You have to be on for that much longer as well. So power point, I'm not very clear. Uh, doesn't sound very convincing at first look at least. That the power efficiency, whatever numbers they are quoting, but I'm sure there is data to back it. Right? Yeah, that we have to consider so many factors. Uh... Mm. Because my point is like, if you are on for longer, then you're also burning more power, right? Compared to, let's say, something like LoRa. No, no, you are not. Uh, see, all, uh, I'll just bring up the, can you see the figure here? Mm. See, uh, when I say longer, I'm saying uh, from here to here, it is transmitting. Mm. But uh, the gaps, it is going to switch off. Mm. The radio and the circuitry is going to switch off. Between two sub packets, it is going to be switched off. Mm. So that is for the implementation to manage it smartly. Right. But when I say it is transmitted over a long time, I'm talking from the first radio burst to the 24th radio burst. Mm. So that is the transmission time of a radio frame. Got it. But within the frame, it is going to be sleeping quite a lot. Mm. It will wake up only for the radio burst. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. Any further questions? I see Nitin Jain is also here. Naveen, Sudhir. Uh, what, is, uh, what is the speak, uh, frequency spectrum that this uses? Is it sub gigahertz, is it? Yeah, sub gigahertz. 868 uh, megahertz in Europe, 915 megahertz in uh, US. So the equivalent one in uh, India may be 867. Because uh, why I'm asking is, for example, 11 AH or something as a standard, but each country has their own frequency spectrum for that. And uh, yeah, yeah, 11 AH. Uh, is it the 11 AH? Is it the Wi-Fi halo? Uh, what they used to call as Wi-Fi halo. Uh, yeah, something of the sort. Yes. Yeah, just let me just check. Uh, 
yeah hello hello 11ah see 11ah is not a commercial success nobody is actually deploying it that is what i have been hearing correct so there is not much talk about or even comparisons with 11ah any other questions Uh, regarding the service center and application center, so yeah. are there any vendors uh, who uh, from where, uh, like if you are putting up a lab and want to yeah. use the entire thing, is there yeah. any uh, vendors from whom we can uh, yeah, download? Yeah, good and question. In fact, for that, the, uh, there is not much information except for this one. RS IoT, they, are, they have not yet announced their offering, but uh, I mean, what I mean is uh, their offering is not yet uh, released. The market, okay. but they have announced that they are in the process of building a complete MyOT network solution, which includes the base station, service center, and application center. Okay. okay. So you can take a look look at uh, REST IoT. Okay. 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 Thank you. And uh, this REST IoT actually they are leveraging, they are already doing something similar for LoRa, for LoRa based networks. So they are leveraging on that experience to build a similar solution for MyOT. So this also kind of partly answers Vinit's question when existing players in the LoRa space also take interest in the MyOT space, then it is something to be looked at. Yeah, that's actually quite interesting, right? It's the kind of validation in a way. And one more thing is, let's say ST Microelectronics, they have not, they have decided not to make their own software stack. Rather, they have partnered with Stackforce, which offers a software stack uh, for the embedded. Now, the Stackforce architecture is such that it offers a multi stack solution. That means the same stack can be customized for MyOT, LoRaWAN, Wireless, Modbus, and Sigfox. So, yeah. Uh, so that is the way to, so if you think of building your own stack, this is the way to do it. Like a, make a generic stack which can be customized for multiple standards. Any further questions? Okay, so we have come to the end of the session and uh, so this article you can read. This is, gives a high level view of MyOT. And uh, deeper technical information is there in this other article, Telegram Spitting Ultra Narrow Band, which I did not cover much in today's session because it goes a uh, little uh, deeper into the protocol aspects and the uh, nature uh, packet, uh, the processing chain, the packet structure, and all that. So, this will be more interesting to people who are going to implement it or test it. But if you want a general overview, it is sufficient to read this article. Okay, so thanks for joining today's session and thanks for all your interesting questions.